Greetings, Ohio Valley. This is Dan Lima with OSU Extension from Belmont County. And this is Karen Cox from WVU Extension in Ohio County. Thanks for tuning in to Extension Calling, your source for research-based information for the farm, garden, and home. Greetings, Karen and the Ohio Valley. Greetings, Dan, and elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> the other side of the Ohio Valley. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we do have to remember this show does spread out pretty far. That's right. So, and beyond. <laughs> and beyond. Uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, or whenever it is you're listening to this. All right. So, yeah, we've been a little crazy busy lately trying to keep up with everything. It is the season. But one of the calls we have been getting a lot, not to just jump right into it, there's been a lot of problems with shrubs in the area that have shown significant dieback after the winter. And so we wanted to touch on some of the potential causes for that dieback, starting with how winter happened this year. Yet mild, but mean, right? It totally was mean. It just <laughs> it like was. threw you for loops every time you went outside. It's like, is it going to be hot today or is it going to be cold today? I don't know. I know. Yeah. And when it got cold, it got colder than it normally would at that time of the year, too. So, yeah, there's just, I don't know if there is a regular winter anymore. <laughs> um, the rules have changed. The rules have definitely <laughs> changed. Like it used to be, I guess February was always the coldest. Always had an ice storm in February without fail because it always happened on the nights for the ag dinners. (laughs) To be honest with you, though, an ice storm will happen when it's closer to freezing. But when it gets really cold, it gets really dry and there's really not that much precipitation. But I guess maybe January would be coldest and then February would be wettest. But that cold spell in December and those winds, I know it's been colder in the past, but those winds did a lot of damage, not only to trees, but smaller guys as well. And it just felt cold. I mean, wind is just a mean thing when you couple it with cold temperatures. Especially when you have leaves, <laughs> you know, because you get those those dry winter winds actually have a desiccating effect. And so they'll draw, they'll pull, they'll actually suck the water out of the plants and the plants can close up their, their stomates. The stomata. Yeah, they can close up their stomata. Yeah, it's one stoma, two stomata. Okay. Or maybe it's the other way. I thought it was is it one stomata and two, what? is it one stomata and one stoma? But anyway, they they have these little <laughs> holes on the bottom of their leaves that they use to breathe and uh, let air, water vapor out, right? And so when they get it gets really hot or really cold, they try to close those holes. But there's only so much a plant can do when you have really strong winds that the moisture can still get pulled out and those leaves get dried up really quickly. And so for plants that hold their leaves in the wintertime, they were really badly hit by that weird, super cold, super windy period in December. Yeah, they open up the the stomata to let CO2 in, but they can't help but lose water at the same time. Mm -hmm. They have to photosynthesize. You know, it's not really it's not really breathing, but like they got to live. So they got to make sugars. Right, right, right. But then you're always going to lose water. The only exception to that is, um, so usually most of these plants during the daytime, it's open because that's when the sun's shining. It's when they're working. And the CO2 comes in and photosynthesis happens. And man, it's it's just amazing, right? But but in desert plants, it actually works the other way. I want to say it's cam photosynthesis. Man, I hope like my... Botany teacher isn't listening because I'm getting all this stuff mixed up. But I want to say it's CAM. Yeah, it's CAM photosynthesis. You're right. And with desert plants, you have the exact opposite. It'll compartmentalize the CO2. Like it'll open up at night, not run everything together. And then it'll close during the daytime because it doesn't want to lose all that water because water is kind of a very good commodity, very rare commodity in a desert. And it will use the CO2 that it 
siphoned up at night to photosynthesize with the light reactions, but it's desert plants. And um, if you're not a desert plant, then you got to take the good with the bad. Well, and there's another kind of desert that a lot of people don't think about. Deserts aren't always hot. There's the tundra, right? And that is basically a cold desert. And so when you have those cold desert-like conditions, our plants in this region were designed to live with lots of moisture. We are almost in a temperate rainforest here because we get so much rain. And so our plants are designed to deal with water. But when there's no water, um, that's when you start to get some significant dieback on some of our plants. And so there's been a lot of calls this year about, you know, why are my shrubs dead? They were fine last year. What's going on? Well, partially dead. Yeah, partially dead. Yeah. And, and well, some of them have some pretty significant damage to them, but they're mostly the ones that are where you use rocks as mulch because those rocks don't really hold the moisture like wood chips and things like that do. And so that's where really I've seen more damage. And on the, on the storm side. Yeah. Like any plants that don't have anything on the western side of them, like if you plant some on the eastern side of the house where the house is like the big west side barrier. Blocks those winds. Most of the time, they're just getting that harsh wind coming up from the northeast. Yeah, and then, you know, once those plants get stressed, then you start to see more occurrences of disease infiltration. So boxwood blight is a fungal disease that is becoming more and more prevalent in this area. And it was distributed through greenery that was like for wreaths or, you know, on nursery stock, things like that. But it is a fungal disease and it basically starts out as black or darkened spots on the leaves. Then those little spots kind of combine together, spread out uh, and, and making the whole leaf look kind of a darker color, like it's got splotches all over it. And so that is typical symptoms or signs of this infection. The streaks can actually go down onto the stem. So if you're seeing this on your boxwood, it is potential that it has boxwood blight, but we can't confirm it unless we have a sample. So if you think that your plant is experiencing symptoms of boxwood blight and not winter kill, then you want to make sure that you take a sample and send it into your local um, university or privately run um, pathology lab so that they can run those tests to make sure because you can't treat something that you've, unless you know what it is, right? And so it could be something else. It could be a virus that's impacting your plant. And if you're treating it for a fungus, you're not going to have a, the effect that you want, right? You're just wasting your time and money. And so it's really important for us to identify what is wrong with the plant. Our Plant Pathology Lab for Extension in West Virginia is an amazing group of people. And, you know, they can go through and they will, they process thousands of plants. It's amazing. They, they're, they are really hard workers and they can figure out what's going on and they could, they'll tell you what the disease is, if there is a disease or potentially if it is environmental. And so you do have to fill out the application form completely because we need to know is it just affecting one little part of the plant? Is it affecting all the plants in the neighborhood? How are the symptoms showing? Because usually if it's affecting all the plants in the neighborhood, it's environmental. And that's when you get back to that winter kill issue that we were talking about earlier, where they just dried out over the winter and couldn't come back. And, you know, they might still come back. There might still be some starches in those roots that'll help restart the plant. Depends on what kind of plant it is. But if it's just in one little patch, then that's more indicative of either an injury, insects, or a disease. Right. But we did have a lot of environmental damage. And with environmental damage, sometimes you'll get these diseases that, you know, you could have your, your boxwood for 10 years and you're like, how come it's never happened before? But a lot of these fungal diseases are opportunist. So they'll infect the plant as a secondary injury to an environmental stressor. So like the plants weakened by the cold spell, mm -hmm. things are damaged, bark is chipped and a disease can affect, can affect the, um, 
the boxwood. I'm trying not to say box elder because <laughs> I was doing that before. <laughs> That's a very different plant. <laughs> so the boxwood is small shrub. The box elder is the big tree. Small tree, but okay. <laughs> I, small tree, bigger than the box wood. Yes, bigger than a box wood. <laughs> so there we go. It's all it's all relative there. <laughs> but you could have that box wood for a decade plus. You know those little those little shrubs are pretty hardy, mm-hmm. and you're seeing these symptoms that you've never seen before, and you're like. Uh, you know, why hasn't this disease happened before? But again, it got so cold in December and the temperature dropped so fast and the winds just dried everything out. It could have killed a section of it. It could have killed like the buds that were in the storm side, like I was saying before. But it, maybe it didn't kill the whole thing. And most likely it didn't. So, you know, what we were talking about was some ways to remedy the environmental damage in this case is just like a light shear of the dead leaves and try to get that light penetrating and maybe get some buds to come out again. But it might be a little early to just say, heck with it, I'm getting something new. But if you are replacing these boxwoods, it's good to go with the newer varieties. Newer varieties tend to be hardier. If you are looking to replace boxwoods, you know, ask the uh, the nursery about new varieties, ask them about more disease resistance because, you know, they, they try to improve things as they come out. So if you are replacing something, try not to go with the old one because there's usually newer and better things. And that's just, you know, selective breeding for the problems that have come about. Right, right. And a few of the most resistant varieties for boxwood blight would include the Baldwin, Golden Dream, Green Beauty, uh, National, and also there's there's a couple other ones that are tolerant, uh, Winter Gem, Green Gem. Those are just a few examples. There's a few more out there, but there's a great publication from Purdue Extension on boxwood blight that will give you a good listing of resistant cultivars. If you are looking to install some boxwood, it's a great read. It's Purdue Extension Boxwood Blight from their Plant and Pest Diagnostic Laboratory. But also, anytime you're buying any plant, you want to make sure that you're buying it from a reputable nursery so that you're not getting potential diseases. So they'll be scouting and they'll make sure that they're using good, clean plant stock and things like that. But even then, even if you've bought it from a reputable nursery, you want to isolate that plant when you get it home, especially if you're putting it in and amongst other plants that could carry the same disease. So Pachysandra and Sweetbox also can carry this boxwood blight or be affected by boxwood blight. So if you're bringing home a new boxwood, don't put it in immediately, you know, give it a couple of weeks maybe just to, to check it out, look for any insect or disease problems on the plant before you put it in with other plants that could be impacted by something it's carrying. Yeah. And with that, try to replace the mulch too, because the mulch is a good inoculant for a lot of these fungal diseases. So yeah, if you had, if you had a blight, take out your boxwoods before and you put in it, you do your homework and you get one that's a little bit more disease resistant. Resistant does not mean immune. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. Just throwing that out there, you know? <laughs> no, no, that's good. But it'll, it'll help. And, you know, try to, try to get new wood chips because that wood, those wood chips could be a source of inoculum too, because fungus does like to break down organic matter. Wood chips are very organic. Right. And the odds of you picking out every single little tiny boxwood leaf that fell that has those, the spores on it is going to be really difficult without taking out all of the mulch. So that you do want to do some really good sanitation when you are removing a plant that has died from a disease, especially if you're going to put a similar plant back in its place. Yeah. And don't compost that stuff. Don't compost, you know, the, the leaves that are look diseased or the, and you'll unfortunately have to dispose of that mulch too. And in one general rule that I've always done for woody ornamentals or even trees, but mainly, you know, when we talk about fertilizing, uh, we talk about fertilizing smaller shrubs, woody ornamentals, fruit trees or something you tend to fertilize, but maybe not like a shade tree, right? 
So you got roses, you have boxwoods, not box elders. <laughs> <laughs> the, the rule that that we typically teach in Ohio State Extension is not to fertilize after July 4th, roughly. So in July, because what you're doing is, you know, we're, we're talking about going into winter. I know it's, you're like, Dan, it's summertime. Like, what are you talking about going into winter? There is a circadian clock, a, just a cycle that the plant goes through. And a lot of times fertilizing late in the summer, going into the fall and the winter, what you'll do is you'll have stimulated the plant enough to start growing and then it doesn't get as hardened off for the winter and you might get more of that environmental type damage. So grass is one thing, <laughs> but woody shrubs have to harden it off to overwinter. And a lot of times the rule is after July 4th, don't dump the fertilizer on there. With roses, you get that high phosphorus fertilizer and it does stimulate flower production, but that's done May, June, not late in July. Because that's when you know, you'll get too much growth and then you'll have those canes die back further than they normally would, unfortunately. Right. You know, it's just like we've talked about in the past when you're looking at a pesticide application for a woody perennial that you want to remove, be it poison ivy or tree of heaven, you want to make sure that you wait long enough for the cycle to shift gears where it's no longer pushing out new growth, but instead now it's starting to store up for the winter. And so it's the same kind of concept that's at play here where you're looking at making sure that you keep that directional flow where it needs to go. So if you give it a high dose of fertilizer in July when it's starting to shift that directional flow, it's going to go, oh, wait, it's still time to grow. I'm going to keep growing. And it's not going to shift in time to do what it needs to do to harden not get those buds ready to be hardened off, get them glazed over, you know, get all of those protective measures that are put in place to start building those walls that cause the leaves to fall or change colors and, you know, all of that stuff. It it takes time for plants to do that. And if they get that nice boost of growth, then then you don't have that result. But even going back to the spring, when you're fertilizing your woody plants, and you can fertilize shade trees, you just, you've really got to watch that nitrogen because you don't want to give them that super boost where they're going to grow really fast and have a lot of exposed soft tissue. Those new branches don't have the protections that the older growth has. And so even one-year-old growth has more protection than, you know, that new growth that was just I don't know, hatched out of its bud, you know, <laughs> that new baby growth, because that, that's where you get a lot of disease problems. And so when you're fertilizing trees, always use, or woody plants in general, always use a slow release nitrogen fertilizer so that it just gives a little bit over time. You never want to give it a lot of nitrogen all at once, but also you don't necessarily want to focus on that nitrogen side of things. Nitrogen's great for growing leaves, but when you're looking at your woody plants, you want good structure, good strength, good root production. And so that's when you're leaning more towards your phosphorus and your potassium. Right. And the thing about phosphorus and potassium is that they linger, they stay around. Mm -hmm. So if you have those levels built up enough, you technically don't need more because the plant has enough. And how do you know what those are? You do a soil test. <laughs> I was going there, Karen. <laughs> well, you got you got soil test. <laughs> and look, I mean, you'll you'll end up saving money if you think your tree needs more nutrients. Let's say like it wasn't as flowery and showy this year as it was last year. So you're like, man, it must be hungry. I and I need fertilizer. We spent all this money on phosphorus and potassium when what really happened is a late frost killed all the all the flowering buds. So it had nothing to do with fertilizer. Well, you know, that twelve dollars soil test is a lot cheaper than like the thirty the thirty dollars of fertilizer you got. <laughs> mm -hmm. And plus it can help you open your eyes to what those other potential problems could be. Okay, well, I know it's not nutrients. My tree has access to nutrients. What else could be going on? And that's when we start investigating and looking a little deeper, looking at the 
root flare? Does it have any damage to it? We start looking at broken branches and limbs, maybe poor pruning in the past where pathogens could have gotten into the tree. You look for bird damage, like are the sap suckers really having at your tree? And unfortunately, once a sap sucker family has decided your tree is lunch, then they keep coming back and it's really hard to dissuade them. But typically they're going to pick a tree that's already starting to decline anyway. And so, you know, nature knows things and we need to pay attention to what's going on before we just start throwing chemicals at it because chemicals aren't always the answer. And the wrong chemical can actually make the problem worse. And that goes for whether the chemical kills things or whether the chemical is a fertilizer and helps things. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. You can kill something just as fast with too much love. (laughs) This is so true. This is so true. Ask people with (laughs) houseplants. I water it. 14 times a day. (laughs) (laughs) The soil's never dry. I don't know why it's wilting. And just so you know that you were we're talking about overwatering of houseplants, which is the number one killer of houseplants. So if your plant looks like it's wilting and you're watering it a lot, stop watering it. Yeah. Because, and you're like, why though? Why does it do that? (laughs) It'll it'll close off those roots just to get the water out. (laughs) Well, if you're rotting the roots, the plant can't take up water. And then... The leaves are wilty, but more water is just going to make the situation worse. Yeah, it is. (laughs) But that's a whole nother show. We're talking about woody plants outside right now. (laughs) Yeah. All right. So here's another thing that we're looking at when we're talking about woody plants. You know, woody plants live a long time typically, especially if they're put in the right place and given the right care. But As we are looking at these weird temperature shifts, these weird winters, these weird summers, like this week, it is going to be 90 in the day and 50 at night. I, <laughs> it's like, okay, sure. And, and dry as a bone. <laughs> yeah, and so dry. And so when you're looking at adjusting your future landscaping, you want to think about, okay, we're watching the... I don't know. I don't want to say biome, but the ecosystem. I don't know. You know, we're watching the weather from the south move up north. And so we're getting warmer. We're getting drier, but with more frequent storms. And so it's it's really hard to digest all of this, but it's also hard for your plants to digest all of this. And so when you're looking at plants, maybe go to one zone warmer than you typically would, especially for your woody plants, but also recognize by doing that, you're going to have to give them a little more care as they're getting established when those winters come. So if you have a evergreen, sometimes using a spray to reduce desiccation can help. Sometimes that can cause more problems than it's worth. But again, that's another show. Or you could put up a windbreak for it for the winter or wrap it in something that can help slow that wind down. You know, I I like the idea of a windbreak just because, especially for smaller plants, you can just put up a little decorative fence around it and it'll help slow that desiccation. But also watering your plants in the wintertime. A lot of people think that, well, the leaves fell off, so it's dormant, but those plants are still actively working. They're just doing different things and you can see. So even in a with a deciduous tree that has no leaves on it, it's still actively growing. It's still working on its root system and it's still working on filling those buds with what it needs to get them to grow the next year. So it is still growing. They do still need water, especially when you have just planted them and it's super dry out. So water your plants in the wintertime, um, especially if we have really dry spells. And of course, water your plants when they're actively growing when we get a dry spell. Remember, we're taking them out of their natural environment and we're forcing them into our environment, which has a lot of hard paved surfaces, a lot of reflected light, and a lot of wind tunnels. And if you have plants that are growing next to your house, you know, beneath the overhang, well, they're not getting that rain and snow like they normally would out in the open. But here's here's something. Um, You're talking about evergreen trees, Karen, and, um, you know, we are talking about woody ornamentals as well. Mm -hmm. Here's an interesting thing that I learned this year. 
if you have a hydrangea and you are planting a hydrangea, which is a woody ornamental, very nice one, or it can be, it can be both, both herbaceous and woody, <laughs> but hydrangeas, they like the afternoon shade, but if you're shading with an evergreen, something like a white pine, these pine trees have pretty superficial roots that stretch pretty far. And one of the things that I learned was because they're much better at taking up water than that hydrangea is, what you'll find is that because it takes, it takes a lot of water also to maintain that flower. So during the summer at flowering, if you're planting your hydrangeas too close to evergreens in the, in the pine family or the spruce family, I guess evergreens in general, they will actually outcompete the hydrangea for water, even though you're trying to give it shade. To maintain that flower, it'll actually hurt the floral show of the hydrangea in the summertime because it'll just take up the water faster. So it's just another thing to keep in mind, you know, is, hey, if that's the best spot and you're going to have to deal with it, then you have to deal with it. There's never a perfect solution. There's very rarely a perfect solution. (laughs) Keep in mind that trees use a lot of water. And part of the water that they use actually works to cool the environment surrounding them through transpiration. They pull the water out of the soil and they leave it up in the atmosphere and it pulls the heat up with it and helps to cool our surroundings. And so, yes, trees use a lot of water and that's great for our area too, because you think about, you know, one tree pulling up 500 gallons of water here and you think about, well, what if that tree wasn't there? And so some people, when they cut down a tree, they find out that, oh, now their yard is wet because the tree is no longer removing all of the water from those heavy clay soils that don't drain really well. And so it's a balance, right? We have to have that balance. And like Dan said, there's no perfect solution, but by knowing the needs of the different plants around us and the impact that we can have on them, we can all have healthier plants with a better, with better success, right? Right. Thanks for listening to Extension Calling. This show is a collaboration between OSU Belmont County Extension Educator Dan Lima and WVU Ohio County Extension Agent Karen Cox. If you'd like a transcript of this show, contact us at the office. Also, let us know if you enjoy the show by ranking us on your podcast app.